Hello, and welcome to a bit of a different video to ones that I've put out recently. This is going to be very story and, in particular, character focused. It's been a few weeks now since I finished the Shadowbringers main scenario quest, and uh, the videos 47 and 48, which are my Amorot and Dying Gasp trial videos, have literally just released as I am writing the script for this. And in the time since, I've come to the realisation that I don't think I articulated my points particularly well there. So in this video, I'd like to spend a little bit of time going over why I was fairly apathetic to that reveal and in order to understand this you need context so first of all i've always loved greek myths so i've got plenty of experience and bias towards the storylines in fact one of the very first projects that i ever did for school way back at primary school was a big project on greek myths it helps, or doesn't help, depending on your point of view, that in the first couple of books that I wrote as a professional writer, um, that Hades has a reasonably prominent role. And therefore, because, you know, because I didn't want to tread on anybody's toes, I had to do my own take on his character for that, based in, in myth and legend. And with a little bit of kind of Disney coloration, because I've always loved Disney's Hercules and James Wood's particular take on that character. So I, I, I brought some of that into my writing and therefore I've got my own version of Hades, that character in mind constantly. And it's sometimes difficult to separate the Greek myth from my own particular spin on these events. So that's what I'm going to do to start off with. I'm going to take a look at the separation, the parallels between Hades from Greek myth and Emmet Selk and examine, first of all, why I think it does work as a reveal. Because as I said, I've had a lot more time to think and I really do believe it does work as a reveal with a couple of caveats, which I'll get into later. So first of all, Hades the eldest of the three brothers who overthrew the Titans in Greek mythology. After defeating the Titans, they drew lots to split up the world, to split up creation, and Hades arguably pulled the short straw and was charged with guarding the underworld while Poseidon took the sea and Zeus took the sky. And with the underworld, he was given the task of looking after the souls of the dead, which draws obvious parallels with Emmett Selk, who has taken the responsibility on his own shoulders of safeguarding the thousands upon thousands of souls of the, the ancients, the ancient uh, people, the Amoritines. Um, Just as the Greek Hades was unconcerned with the living, so too is Emmett Selk, to the extent that he doesn't even really see the people of Eorzea or the First or wherever, as alive because to him they are just broken fragments of souls that he would like to make whole again the biggest difference between the the classical hades and emmet selk in this regard is that hades had no desire to give life back to the people under his care depending on which period of greek history you're looking at the souls of the dead were in their final resting place or later history had been judged and sent to their punishments or paradise. In the, the final cutscene in episode 47, just before you, uh, you queue up for the dying gasp, Emmett Selk mentions that you know, he's taking the warrior of light to his final judgment, but in myth, Hades was not the judge of the damned. Whichever versions of the Hades myths, and there aren't many myths with Hades in, um, he was not the judge. Um, that was a job left to uh, three kings who actually became the judges of the damned after they died. There was Minos, Radamanthus, and who was the other one? Achus? Yeah. Now, it could be argued that Amorot is Emmet Selk's version of Paradise, the utopian fields of Elysium, the Elysian fields. 
and that he is trying to restore it to what it once was for the good of the people uh, who he has recreated as shades in this phantom city just as they would have been shades in the Greek underworld and that he's not just acting out the will of Zodiac that he has that kind of independent thought this is what he wants he wants to bring back his people for the sake of his people not just because Zodiac wants it now Hithlidaeus does say that Emmett Selk has forever been champion of Zodiac's will but I find it quite interesting that Emmett Selk rarely mentions Zodiac in the storyline rather he he does seem soulful and mournful and focused on the loss and the regret that he feels about the loss of his people he doesn't do a whole lot of praise for the elder primal zodiac the, the godlike figure that they created for their own salvation in myth hades was portrayed as a rather passive creature which ties in quite nicely demic Salt's character has someone who as he says likes to watch he is an empire builder he whispers in people's ears and lets other people do the work he lets mankind bring about its own ruin he just provides that little gentle push a little bit like um the representation of Ares in the the latest wonder woman movie if you've seen that Hades in myth was also a fairly altruistic character. He was not evil, despite the the, the modern uh, connotations that we have, which where, where death and evil are very much similar. Um, that wasn't the case. The Greeks didn't believe that Hades was evil. In many of the, the stories involving the underworld where heroes went down, he gave several of the heroes that made it to the underworld chances to return and he even at one point let Heracles or Hercules borrow Cerberus in order to complete one of his legendary labours as long as Heracles made sure that Cerberus wasn't hurt in the process. Likewise, Emmett Selk can be seen in some ways as being a fairly altruistic character. Whilst he might have ulterior motiv motivations for days, he clearly aids our heroes from the source. He brings his stola back from the live stream. He didn't need to do that. He grants us boons of knowledge to better understand what it is that we are fighting for and against. He doesn't need to do that anyway. For all that, Hades in myth is quite cold and stern. He is very intense. And his primary focus is the safeguarding of the souls under his care and ensuring that none of his subjects ever left the underworld. He was uh, known to get very enraged if people escaped or tried to escape. He was very single-minded in his duties, just as Emmett Selk is single-minded in his, despite the, the rather glib manner with which he speaks as he plots every hour of every day. Hithelias talks about the, the weight of responsibility that Emmett Selk has on his shoulders. Now, in Greek myth, Hades w was kind of forced to take those responsibilities on by, uh, by necessity, whereas it seems like Emmett Selk had a choice he took those responsibilities on because he wanted to because he could not bear the thought of continuing to live without his people without the people that he lost and it's one of the things that makes us really empathize with him as a character so for all of these obvious parallels why was i unsatisfied with the reveal and that is kind of hard to put into words i struggled with this section of the script so hades has been in several final fantasy games now he was an enemy in final fantasy 5 a necromancer enemy he was a uh, summon 
in Final Fantasy VII. He was a, a hidden super boss in IX. He was, as I've mentioned uh, multiple times now, the final boss in Final Fantasy XI's Seekers of Adeline expansion. And now he's uh, a fully fleshed out character slash final boss in fourteen. So he's been in quite a few games under various different guises. Um, is this the best version of the character in the series? Absolutely, yes. He is a character that is rooted in the lore, the story of the game. He is the, I would argue, the, the best written, most fleshed out villain this game has had so far. I'd argue actually that he's, he's probably one of the best written, most fleshed out villains any of the Final Fantasy games has had. I think it boils down to the fact that I just wish that Emmett Selk hadn't been revealed as Hades. One of the things I liked about Final Fantasy XII, and I know I'm in a bit of a minority when it comes to liking XII, but one of the things I liked about that game was the, the mixing up of familiar Final Fantasy tropes, the, the classic Esper's Ifrit, Shiva, Titan, and so on and so forth, were now the names of airships and were little more than fan service rather than the big summons. Instead, the summons now had new, unique names, which kept them fresh and interesting, as well as allowing for more uh, new and significant artistic designs. Emmett Selk, as a character, is fresh, interesting, fleshed out, well-rounded, well-written. His motivations are laid bare, they are laid clear to us. He is a, he's a particularly well-written antagonist. And then we get the reveal that, surprise, he's Hades. It's, it's too in my face. It's too blatant. It, it lacks the subtlety that uh, has been woven into his character up until this point. I'd been, I would have been much happier, I think, much more satisfied if he'd been given a name that we hadn't heard before. And we'd been allowed to draw the parallels between this new character and the Hades of Greek mythology for ourselves. Hell, I'd, I'd, I'd even have been happy enough if they'd revealed his true name to be uh, Zelera, the Death Seraph, from Final Fantasy XII. But Hades, I don't know, it, it feels too easy. Um, just as Thancred being rescued by Orionje and company feels just a little bit too easy. I mean, tying it to Hades is, it's okay, fan service, I guess. But really, I think they could have taken this opportunity to create something new rather than hearkening back to something old. And it stuck with such a brilliant character that it honestly feels disappointing to tie him back to the past. It is, at the end of the day, a tiny disappointment, however, and I'm sure that as time goes on, I will care less and less about him being Hades and more and more just remember him as Emmett Selt, the guardian of the dead who wanted nothing more and to safeguard the future of his people in the face of oblivion, who truly saw his people for, for what they were, saviours of the planet in its first dark hour, and over the eons never forgot the sacrifices they made. It is understandable that he is bitter towards servants of Hydaelyn, knowing what they did, knowing what she did. As he tells it, she cost them their paradise, their utopia, their Elysium. And as one of only three, well, two and now one, who can even remember what it was like to have lived there at that time, it's no wonder he fought so desperately to bring about its return. As a, a secondary point, or maybe even a final aside, the, the other issue I have with him being Hades in particular are the ties to the place Hades as specifically being the underworld all the way through the the interactions in Amorot especially when it comes to Hithridaeus we, we're told about the catastrophe beginning with a wailing a keening from underground and in the Amorot dungeon the final doom the final boss being Therian, the Chthonic Riddle, 
Now, Chthonic means in, under, or beneath the earth, which is where the Greeks believed Hades' realms to be. And so it muddies the water a little bit too much. It links Hades, M itself, with the onset of this disaster. Both Hades and Persephone were revered in Greek mythology as Chthonic or Chthonian deities. And the Sphinx, actually, which Therion resembles, was also born of Chthonic deities or creatures, depending on which myth that you read. Now, for people that don't care about the etymological or mythological ties and can, can just take that story at face value, this will mean little or nothing to you. And in a way, I kind of envy that. Um, but as somebody, as, as a writer, somebody who's always been fascinated by this kind of stuff, with both Hades and Chthonic being Greek in origin, it just dilutes that distinct separation between facets of this story. Now, of course, it might turn out that Emmett Selk was, in some way, the originator of this initial catastrophe, and that maybe he's simply in denial or was simply in denial about these things. And this, this single-mindedness that he's had since then is his way of making up for causing the problem in the first place. If, if we find out that that is the case, then I will absolutely 110% applaud the writers for being so subtle and clever with sowing those seeds. But right now, without that possible payoff, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like a good choice to me yet. So, in summary, a lot of my out-of-the-left-field disappointment at the Hades reveal, as shown in episodes 47 and 48 of my Shadowbringers MSQ videos, has faded. The more I thought about it, the more parallels uh, to the, the myths of Eld that I've, I've revisited and made fresh in my mind. That being said, I still feel that the reveal as Hades specifically was, like the survival of Thancred, a missed opportunity to tread a new, fresher path, which is generally what Shadowbringers has done. But what are your thoughts on Hades? Did you see it coming? Was it a good reveal? Do you think there's more to it than this? Do you agree with any speculations that I've put forward in this video? If any of you are fans of Greek mythology, are you disappointed? by that muddying of the waters, or is that just a me thing? What have your thoughts? Please leave a comment below and give me more to think about. I hope you've enjoyed this video, this law speculation, this opinion piece. And I will catch you all in the next one. Thank you very much for watching and cheerio. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and subscribe. Remember to ring the bell notification icon to get notified when new videos go live. And until next time, toodle pip.